It's good to be together this morning. Our group seems like we grow a little bit each week. Um, I know it's uh, uncomfortable times. Struggled with this week what to preach and uh, talk about this morning. Who has the remote for switching the projector? You have it. And uh, ultimately settled on, settled, that sounds horrible, decided on uh, just focusing our attention around the cross. Um, with all the uncertainty in the world that's going on, whether it's you know, the you know, different things Gavin prayed about in his prayer this morning. Um, PJ wanted to start Okay. The various things Gavin prayed about this morning, I know we, if you watch the news, we don't have news, although we have a subscription to Hulu, and I think they're now trying to force the news on us with uh, live streaming news, but we, we don't see much news, so I don't get to see a lot of that stuff. I see it when I'm in the airport, and it uh, usually makes me angry, but... Um, if you watch much news, then you may be like some of the other people that are around you and wondering what's going on, what, 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 what's going to happen in the world with all these various things that are going on. And so I thought this morning maybe we would just focus our attention not on what the media keeps throwing at us, not on what may be on our minds on the other six days of the week. We'll keep our attention on Jesus. Because that's where it needs to be anyway. The more we can look at Jesus, the more we can focus on Jesus, the more we can think about what Jesus has done for us, how much God loves us, what wonderful things God has in store for us, both now and especially in eternity. The more we can do that, the more it will help us to get through whatever else is being thrown at us in all these other facets and areas of life. Because he's, he's, he's the key. He's the key to our hope. He's the key to our strength. He's the key to our wisdom. He's the key to all of it. And so a couple months ago, I talked about the insignificance of man, and we talked a little bit about song number 157, At the Cross. That's why it's in quotation marks, because I didn't come up with the title. Isaac Watts did. Uh, many of you know Isaac Watts, one of my favorite songwriters. I uh, don't know whether he's my favorite or not. Dawn used to make fun of me. She said, you've got a lot of favorites. She's right, whether it's songs or Bible verses or whatever. And I think that's okay. I can have a lot of favorites. Uh, I don't, I, maybe I don't know what the word favorite means. Uh, maybe that's my mistake. But I have a lot of things that I really treasure, whether it's songs or passages. So I wanted to think about the words of this song a little bit this morning, and I'm going to put the words for each of the verses up, and then we're going to look at some scriptures that help to focus our attention on that. And it's one of the things I've said to you before about Isaac Watts that I think made him such a genius. Uh, he, he's not a new songwriter. He wrote back in the 1700s. Um, but one of the things that I think made him such a genius in his day was the ability to take passages of scripture and scriptural thoughts um, A.W. Tozer does this in his writings too, and pen them in his own words in ways that just make you think about it in a way that you haven't before. And I think that can be helpful to us, to, to think about scriptural things in ways that maybe we haven't thought about it before. The, and told Andrew this morning, he made a comment about Matthew, the 18th chapter, about the humility of a child I'd never heard made in my life. And it made more sense to me about what that passage is teaching, what Jesus is really saying about children. Because I'm like Greg, I've looked at that before and I've thought, he hadn't met my kids. Because some of them can be really stubborn. I don't know where they got it from. Uh, I'm kind of stubborn. Ashley's a little stubborn herself. But kids can be kind of stubborn. And Andrew made sense of that passage in a way that I had not thought of before. And I think it makes absolute sense with regard to what Jesus is trying to teach in that particular passage. But Isaac Watts does that a lot in his writings. Uh, I, I guess his songs would be more poems, I don't know. 
um, because it was other people typically who put the words to music. But uh, I like the way that he says a lot of the things that he said. And we talked about this particular verse, especially last time. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? And we talked a little bit about the way that modern hymn publishers want to change lyrics. But that's what Isaac Watts wrote, such a worm as I. That's how he viewed himself. And we talked about that, focused on that primarily in the last lesson that we talked about. So I'm not going to go over that uh, extensively. But I uh, just want you to think about the fact that the Lord's Supper is to remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus. And we can think about various aspects of that. And I, th I think it's important for us sometimes to think about the fact that Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' selflessness, Jesus' giving of himself began long before the cross. I don't know about you, but if you've thought about it very much, I, I can't imagine ever being in heaven and wanting to come here. But Jesus did. And as Greg's mentioned several times in our Bible study, if I were going to leave heaven and come here, you can bet that it's not going to be as a baby in a poor family with a father who's a carpenter. And I'm not going to have any kind of notoriety at all. But that's what Jesus did. And he came to the earth and he lived among all of us like us didn't enjoy special privilege, went through all the things that we go through far more than I will ever experience. And he lived a life of service while he walked here among all of those people that he was a part of. And their stubbornness and their hatred and their bigotry, Jesus patiently dealt with all of that. And then ultimately was willing to go to the cross. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the fact that Jesus' sacrifice is the only means. Only means. It's important in the world that we live in where re re religiousness, religiosity, I don't know, whatever word you want to use to describe that, seems to still be a fairly big thing. But uh, people mean a lot of different things by that. And they seem to think that as long as you believe in some kind of higher power, that that's all that it takes to have a relationship with that higher power and to have the hope of some kind of uh, eternal future that's going to be a blessing. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is the only means of forgiveness. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the only way that we could be forgiven. And that should remind us, as we talked about last week, and as Isaac Watts pens in his first verse, of our own unworthiness. Because if you look at Romans chapter 5 with me for a moment, <clears throat> and I know I've used this passage, I've been here 12 and a half years now. I know I've used this passage probably hundreds of times. But there is just no other passage that I think says it quite as succinctly and quite as clearly as this one does. When we think about how unworthy we are and what, a, what an amazing gift Jesus' death on the cross was for us, this verse for me sums it up. For when we were still, verse 6, without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus didn't die for the lovable. Most of us can think of someone that we would be willing to die for. And in most of our cases, I almost be willing to say in every one of our cases it would be somebody that we like that, that's the kind of people we'd be willing to die for and that's essentially what Paul says here and there might be 
some other people who are out there that we consider good people that we might be willing to, in the heat of the moment, step into battle for them and, and, and die for them. But that's not who Jesus came to die for. He didn't come to die for the spiritually elite of his age, although they were mistaken in the, what they understood to be spiritual eliteness. Jesus didn't come to die for the people who were already perfect because there were none. He came ultimately to die not just for the people like his apostles who followed him, and not just for good people who might have been on the fringes who were walking around with him. He came to die for the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders and the scribes who were all inciting the crowds at his crucifixion to call for his death. That's who he came to die for. He came to die for everybody. The, the lovable, the unlovable, the downright hateable. Jesus came to die for all of them. That's an amazing gift. Where, where are you in that group? Well, most of us here this morning are people who have recognized his authority and have submitted ourselves to him. But I didn't do that all my life. I've, I've not always been like I am now. And I pray to God I won't be like I am now in 20 years if I'm still alive. Jesus came to die for that high schooler who was sneaking out of his window, bedroom window at night to go to get into all kind of trouble. Jesus came to die for the college student who got drunk at college parties, fell down a flight of steps, ended up in, a ba ended up in the hospital. Jesus came to die for all of those people who have done all manner of wicked things, sinful things. Against him, against other people, Jesus came to die for them. Jesus died for a worm like me. That's what Isaac Watts said. And hopefully as we sing that song, we can think about the greatness of that gift. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree, verse 2 says. In Galatians chapter 3, a, a fascinating chapter. If you get a chance to study that chapter a little bit more, we're just going to look at a couple of verses this morning. But, but do it, because the ultimate point of that chapter chapter is and he, he makes the argument on the basis of the singularity or plurality of a word seed he says it was not into seeds as of many but to seed one and the point the whole point of galatians 3 is that jesus christ is the sole inheritor of everything our father has you say, well, where does that leave us? Well, the, the point of Galatians 3 is you better be in Him, in Him, if you want to share in the inheritance. If you want to be joint heirs with Him, you have to be in Him. And He tells us how to do that. Through faith and, and submission to the will of God. But in verse 10, He says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For, he says, the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus became the curse for us. And you're a smarter person than I am if you know what all that entails. I just have to take it at face value because I don't understand all of what it means for Jesus to have suffered in my place and to have taken the curse for me. But I know that's what Paul says. And the, the way that he puts it in this particular passage is, uh, basically talking about a passage in Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter, where they hanged someone on a tree because their sins were egregious enough 
that it demanded their death. And Jesus became the curse because it wasn't for his own sin that he hung on the tree, but for mine. He took my place. I should be the one on the tree. I should be the one who is dying for my sin. And instead, it was Jesus who died for me. <clears throat> the, the person in Deuteronomy 21, his sin was worthy of death, and so he was hanged. But Jesus is different. And Isaiah 53 makes that point very clear to us. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, another one of my favorites. Says, surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I find it interesting in verse 4 that, they, that the passage says, We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Psalm 22 makes some of the same points and incidentally when you look at the gospel accounts of the crucifixion that's essentially what the people were saying if you were really the son of God if you were really as great as you say you are you wouldn't be hanging there on that cross because the only people who die the way that you die are people who deserve it and people who have no favor in the sight of God can you imagine having the power that Jesus had, has? Can't really talk about it past tense, can I? <clears throat> and hearing all of the things that the people were saying and doing nothing. He did that because He loves us. And because He knew that what he was doing in that moment was the only way that a worm like me could be forgiven and reconciled to God and have a hope of being with him when this life's over. He did that because he knew that the only hope any of those people had was for him to silently endure what he was going through and to ultimately give up his life Read John 10 again. Jesus gave up his life. Then read the gospel accounts and look at the way Jesus dies. I submit to you it's the reason why the centurion, when he saw the way Jesus died, said, surely this must be what, what, whatever it was he said, a son of the gods, the son of God, whatever words that he used. There was something about the way Jesus died that was different than the way that anybody else he had ever seen die on a cross, had died before. And the reason was because Jesus didn't expire. Jesus gave up his life. And he did that for my sins, and he did that for your sins, and he did that for the sins. Anybody you can name, I don't care how grotesque and ugly they are, Jesus gave up his life for their well-being so that ultimately they could have the hope of being with him and being with the Father when this life <clears throat> is over. <clears throat> the scourging, I don't know how much you've read, I don't know what kind of movies you've seen. The, the Romans weren't the ones who invented crucifixion, but they seemingly perfected it. And every single thing that led up to it was designed to inflict as much pain as possible without killing the victim. And the same thing was true of the crucifixion. Jesus experienced every lash, all the nails, every surge of pain that would flow through his ner every nerve and fiber in his body with every breath he forced himself to take. Jesus did that for you. And he did that for me. So that we could be reconciled to God. 
This verse is just magnificent. <clears throat> well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. Well might the sun in darkness hide. I mean, it's just it's marvelous. The gospel accounts <clears throat> bear out the fact, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, that for three hours there was an unusual darkness. Now, some have tried to explain that as being a, 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 a solar eclipse. <clears throat> it doesn't fit with the language described in this particular passage. This was an unnatural darkness that fell upon, I, I, I don't know, was it just the land of Palestine? Was it that particular region of the world? Was it the whole world? I, I don't know, I wasn't there. But it was an unnatural darkness that fell on, the, the, uh, on at least the territory where the writers were and where Jesus was for about three hours. And Isaac Watts writes in a way that makes it sound like, of course it would. Of course the sun would hide itself in an unnatural way when the Son of God is dying on the cross, when the creator of the universe is dying on the cross. Of course it would. I mean, it just makes sense to him that the son would do such a thing. The creator of the universe was on the cross. I heard D. Bowman once, and it's been <clears throat> 20 years ago. This is how you know you're a good communicator and how I know I'm not. <laughs> when somebody 20 years later could tell you exactly what you said. D. Bowman said one time when I was, I don't even remember where I heard him preach said that the creator of the universe was hanged, and I'm paraphrasing, on a tree that he himself had made by people who had made him, who he had made, and allowed them to put him to death. The creator of everything hung on that cross. And Psalm 98, a lot of the other psalms, talk about, the creation almost as though <clears throat> it is singing the praises of God or shouting the greatness of God. And there's some sense in which that's true. I think Psalm 19 is perhaps one of my favorite with regard to this, but I didn't use it this morning. Just because it talks about the fact that their voice goes out everywhere and yet there's nothing heard. Because there's really no voice, right? Right? I mean, we can look at the world that's around us and it does speak about the greatness of God, but it doesn't really speak. Here in this particular passage in Psalm 98, verse 7 says, as it talk, after it's talked about the fact that we should break forth in praise and sing praises to God and rejoice, and, and in this passage talks about with the harp and the sound of the psalm and trumpets and the sound of the horn in verse 6. Then he says in verse 7, Let the sea roar and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. <clears throat> all of the creation shouts about the greatness of God. And the sun on this particular occasion, as the creator of the universe was hanging there, bowed its head. And I just want you to think about for a moment in, the, in view of all the craziness that's going on in our world. <clears throat> the, the sun didn't, I mean, this, the sun doesn't have any will of its own, so it's not like the sun looked at, God hid the sun. But I want you to think about for a moment, with all the craziness that we, we have going on around us, the God who created the sun and who could cause the sun in an unnatural way to hide its face for three hours. I mean, the, the sun's a, a huge object. We talked about in the last lesson, not even one of the biggest stars out there. Kind of average. The God who can cause that to come into being 
and can cause it to be darkened. You think there's anything too hard for him? Anything too difficult? It doesn't matter what we're going through in life, what we're struggling with. And I'm not saying it just all goes away when you think, well, God's just great big and he can take care of all of it. It doesn't all just go away. But we just need to keep reminding ourselves of the fact that God is there. God gave his son to die on the cross. God caused the son to respond in mourning at the death of his, his son on the cross. A God who can do all of that, is there anything really that you're facing that he can't handle? Jesus' death reminds us of how far God is willing to go to take care of us. And if he's willing to go that far to take care of us, what makes us think he's going to let us down now? What, what makes us think that that's this new th- virus that's come out <clears throat> or this latest wave of difficulty that's come out is going to be greater than he is, going to be something he can't handle. More importantly, something he hadn't, hasn't foreseen. Oh, caught him by surprise. God saw this coming. The, the reality is he saw it coming before the world ever existed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being outside of time and seeing 2020 in the same way you could see 2020 B.C. or 4000 B.C.? God knew this was coming. And, And He hasn't told me But I know God's already been dealing with it before we even knew there was a problem. Now, how is he going to deal with it? I don't know. How long is it going to last? I don't know. But God is dealing with the problem before it was ever a problem. Before we ever knew there was a problem, God was already at work behind the scenes working on a solution. And I know that because before man ever existed, God had already foreseen and already foreknew and had already predetermined that his son was going to come to the earth and die for our sins. If God can take care of a problem that big, he can take care of coronavirus or anything else that we face. Isaac Watts finishes a lot of his songs, and I know you've heard me say this before, in a way that I love. He looks at the situation and he thinks about the grandeur of God and the wonderment of what God has done for us. And he thinks, what do I have to give? What, what, what can I give him that's of any value? What, what can I give him that he needs? And the answer is nothing. So, so why bother giving anything, right? Now, that's not how Isaac Watts viewed it. <clears throat> Unlike the son that was in mourning, Isaac Watts, he... he certainly would have mourned what Jesus had to go through. And more and more importantly, the sin that caused Jesus to have to go through it. But instead of just responding with mourning, he responded by saying, this is all I've got. You've redeemed this worthless soul, this worm, from sin. And I don't have anything to give you of any value, of any worth whatsoever, so I give you myself. I I will dedicate the rest of my life to doing whatever I can to serve you and to show how much I love you and how much I appreciate the gift that you've given to me. And that reminds me of Paul. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 1 Timothy, chapter 1, uh, all these different passages. Paul talks about how unworthy he was to be saved, period. I I am the chief of sinners, he would say in 1 Timothy chapter 1. To be saved in general, Paul viewed himself as not, not worthy of such a cause. But then the fact that not only was he saved, 
But he was appointed as an apostle. Paul looked at that and thought, that's just unbelievable to me. I mean, it really was. We look at Paul and we, we see this giant of faith, and he was. And we think, what a great man. Paul looked at himself and thought, how have I been so blessed? What should I do? Well, there's nothing I can give except me. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, <clears throat> in talking about all the times that Jesus was seen, he goes back and be, really begins in verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Paul recognized his unworthiness to be saved. He recognized his unworthiness to be an apostle. And he said, the only thing I have to give is me. My life. And he did that. Paul spoke a lot of times, and this is one of those cases where he kind of speaks tongue-in-cheek. He says he labored more abundantly than they all. I don't, I don't think Paul had really written down all of his accomplishments and compared it with Peter and James and John and, and said, well, look, I've got more than they do. I don't think he had notches on his belt or bedpost for all the people that he had baptized. I don't think Paul thought in that kind of way. So he's speaking kind of tongue-in-cheek here and just talking about the fact that I am not worthy to be who I am and all I can do is labor as hard as I can, as diligently as I can, in wherever I am for as long as I'm there. And that's what Paul did. And I don't think any of us would deny that. The, the writings, his travels, what he went through. I, I, I marvel in... The first preaching journey <clears throat> that he goes through that circuit there in Pisidian Antioch and that whole region of Pisidia. And he ends up in Lystra and Derby, and he's stoned and left for dead. And he goes on to another city and he they they appoint some elders, and then they go right back through the cities where they were. I don't know about you, but if I just got stoned and left for dead in the city, I'm not going back there for a long time. But he knew there were brethren there who needed encouragement, especially after seeing that. I mean, can you imagine being a new convert and the guy who taught you was just stoned and left for dead outside the city? Paul knew what they needed. They needed encouragement. He went back and talked to them again and encourage them and strengthen them. Paul did whatever he could to show God how much he appreciated the gift that Jesus had, gave, had given for him. And that's all we can do too. And we show that by trusting in God. By recognizing that His ways are the right ways. There's some sense in which His ways are the only ways. And ultimately, for our eternal well-being, His Son is the only sacrifice that can save us. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of how great that sacrifice is, of the price that was paid, of the, the wonder of God's love, and of the gift that He has laid up for us when this life is over, when we get to be with Him. Are you hungry for that? Don't, don't tell me that watching the news you don't get hungry for being with God where all that's over. Or we don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. 
Don't tell me you don't get hungry for that. If you don't, then maybe you need to be spending a little more time in your Bible. Looking at what God has done for you. Thinking about the great gift that God's provided for you. And longing for that home that he longs to give us when we leave this life. That has to be what carries us through the coronaviruses and political unrest and civil unrest and whatever else we're facing, injustice in the world, all of it. It's Jesus Christ and Him, him crucified that will carry us through those difficulties. It's, it's He and His strength and His wisdom that's going to help us to overcome the struggles that we face. And it's ultimately He that provides us with the wonder of being with Him. And oh, what a day that will be. If you're here this morning and subject to the invitation in any way, if we can help you in rendering obedience to the gospel, in coming to recognize what great thing Jesus has done for you, and beginning to, as Isaac Watts, just throw up your hands and say, this is all I've got to give, but I give it to you. If you want to begin that journey this morning, we want to help you. And if we can help you as a Christian in some other way this morning, please come and let us know while together we stand and sing.